Is on. Very good. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Wow, there it is. Uh, my name is Charlie Rathbun with Four Culture. Uh, I told Elizabeth, I said, there's no way you can organize a forum in one month. You can't do it. You need committees and you need strategic planning, and nobody's going to come. Um, anyway, thank you, Elizabeth. This is quite the turnout. It's amazing. Um, I, I want to, uh, well, this is what happens when we occasionally stick our head up out of the sand and uh, say, hey, uh, is anybody interested in accessibility for audiences with disabilities? And boom, uh, it just took off. Um, I want to acknowledge a couple people. One is Luis Mendoza, who's standing over here on the side, who came to us uh, well over a year ago. He's with the Washington uh, State Fathers Network in Kindering. In Bellevue. And he approached us and a couple of our partner funders to find out how we could better organize the opportunities that exist and create more opportunities for access for populations with all sorts of disabilities and including uh, cognitive intellectual disabilities and things like that. And he got us meeting with Arts Fund and with the City Arts Office and we have been meeting for well over a year with uh, service providers. Uh, with folks that uh, serve the providers, look for these opportunities and trying to find ways that we can actually do, take all of the opportunities that are out there and figure out a way to make them just more available and accessible. And one, uh, and he's been a tremendous motivator, a great facilitator for us to keep us on point on a pretty sprawling issue. Um, and one other person I would also like to acknowledge is Daniela Federico. If I got that right, Danielle, where are you? Here. <laughs> 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 <She's in my laughs> <home. Yeah. laughs> Danielle has been exactly sensory access. Uh, we are currently working with Daniela on uh, creating a new website, actually augmenting a wonderful website that she already has, to uh, make it a lot stronger, a lot more robust, add in a lot of resources, a lot of training, and yes, you guessed it, even a calendar, uh, and uh, helping to promote that uh, regional, regionally wide throughout King County. And uh, so we now have some resources lining up here that are going to help us actually accomplish a very important part of what we're trying to do, which is make uh, the art accessible to everyone, both for audiences, for artists, for administrators. Uh, so we're just getting started on this, and uh, we're very excited. And I want to uh, thank Elizabeth again for getting this going and organizing it. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Shea, who is my uh, cohort at the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I was going to specifically introduce Daniela with Sensory Access because my main talking point was be sure to get her card before you leave because of that whole online resource that we're talking about that we're going to be in partnership with. Um, we want to get you connected with that service and how you can get more resources on how to do this work um, and make your arts and cultural offerings more accessible um, to people with disabilities across all spectrums. Um, in my office, I also want to uh, acknowledge part of our consortium is also Arts Fund. They cannot be here today, but they have been a part of this year-long process of conversation and dialogue where we've been meeting with social service providers, self-advocates, um, and also um, people in the arts and cultural community such as yourselves. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to Elizabeth for putting today's on. There will be more workshops coming throughout the year that we're also sponsoring, um, so we look forward to being in contact with you for all of those as well. Thanks. Now I'm going to introduce Jeffrey Herman of the Seattle Repertory Theater for making this space available. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm Jeff Herman, I'm the Managing Director here at The Rep. I'm really excited to have you all here um, and have this workshop here <laughs> in uh, The Poncho. Um, the space that you're sitting in um, was recently renovated. We just uh, sort of opened it up in December, so you're among the first um, folks to be in here. Um, these are brand new seating section, um, new AV, nice new wall treatments. Um, we've also added uh, hearing loop technology uh, in the floor here in the space. Um, so I'm really excited to, to have you all here. Um, 
this work in access is something we've been trying to take very seriously here at the Rep. So in addition to the hearing loop in this space, um, we've added it in all of the uh, public locations of our building. Um, we, uh, we've got the uh, wheelchair accessible door to the front entry. There's a lot more for us to do. Um, I think like all of you, we're, we're trying to, to make progress in this area. And I'm really excited about having this opportunity this afternoon to learn more about it um, so we can all make progress as a, as a community together. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you see the Wi-Fi uh, network and password is up there on the screen. Um, bathrooms are out of that door. Um, uh, straight up that way and then uh, just off to the right. Um, and uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, the woman without whom none of this would have been possible, uh, Elizabeth Ralston, who's a force of nature, if you haven't gotten to meet her yet. Um, she, uh, Elizabeth has a public health and not-for-profit background. Her work involves uh, building capacity within organizations to enable them to communicate their mission and impact in an inspiring way to engage volunteers, donors, community partners, and program participants. Um, Elizabeth has served as a consultant in not-for-profit organizations working on uh, program development, fundraising and communications, event planning, and board development. She's been in several interim leadership positions. In fact, she was recently interim operations manager for Spectrum Dance Theater. Um, she's passionate about the arts and grew up into lots of theater shows and museums. Even though she has hearing loss, she does not let that stop her from enjoying all that the arts have to offer. Um, I really uh, appreciate all the work you've done to pull this all together. We're really happy to have you here and to be hosting this. Um, and without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Ralston. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Jeff. Um, welcome, everybody. Let me see a show of hands. Who's from museums? Who's here from museums? Way up high, way up high. Okay, great. How about theaters? Awesome, great. And how about other cultural spaces? Fabulous, fabulous. So welcome. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day to come and spend the afternoon with us, learning all about access and being with these wonderful people who also are spending the time with us to share their experiences about what it's like for them, access and the arts. So I want to give really a bit of a background as to how this all got started. Um, but first, I really have to say thank you to our sponsors, because without our sponsors, we could not be part of it. And um, that goes to um, for culture, arts and um, topics of arts and culture, and of course, the Seattle Web for making this possible. And it's been a great ride, and I know there's many people along the way who made this possible as well. Lots of volunteers and lots of community people who've given me feedback on what's needed and what's missing. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about how I got started um, down this path. Um, as Jeff said, I'm a huge lover of the arts, especially the theater. Um, I grew up with a brother who uh, took every major role he could get in the theater in high school. And I would help him memorize his lines. And so I got to know all the different songs from Rogers and Hammerstein and Gilbert and Sullivan, you name it. And so um, I was also introduced to the theater in London. When my parents moved to London, we um, went a lot to the theater and to museums. My mom was a docent in the um, art museum, so she was huge fan of the arts. So they never let my hearing loss stop me from doing whatever they wanted to do. They just brought me along. And so I was um, uh, eternally grateful for that opportunity. Um, so when I moved to Seattle, I, um, I brought my love of movies here too and realized that none of the theaters uh, had captioning. And this was over 20 years ago. And so I got a bunch of friends together and said, hey, let's Captain Seattle. And we called our group Captain Seattle. And the first theater we worked with was Cinerama. And Cinerama now has captions on um, other movies. And ever since then, it's kind of spread to other movie theaters around Seattle and beyond. Um, and my first, you all know my first global <coughs> captain experience was with the Titanic. And that was in LA, and that was that movie blew me away because it was the first time ever that I had been in the theater with captains, and it was it was an amazing movie to see. 
So that uh, I started thinking about um, equity and access because I'm a public health junkie and I um, have been with nonprofits for many years. And I started thinking about, well, I love going to shows, but I can't go wherever I want. I have to plan on my life around one show or one of the show or um, whatever you know, kind of entertainment there is. So what can we do to make um, the arts more equitable to people with disabilities? So um, I started um, talking with people in the community. I've met a lot of you, there's some new faces here, and started talking and seeing what missing, what the gaps were, and what was needed. Um, and so I also met someone um, in Chicago who was heading up the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium and uh, learned a lot about their effort and realized there were many different efforts around the U.S. And Seattle didn't have one that I knew of. And so in my research, I started finding out about little pockets of efforts that were happening, um, such as Daniela and Lewis's effort. Um, and got really excited about the um, opportunity of making this a larger effort, one that encompasses all people with disabilities. So, that said, the goals of uh, the mission of the consortium, um, the Seattle King County Accessibility Consortium, is to ensure that Seattle King County's private arts and culture arena is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and so the goals of this consortium, as I see it, are um, to provide professional development and training, like this workshop, for example, because many people in the arts um, we are working with limited budgets and other staffing and that, a whole host of other issues. And um, it's hard to think about accessibility when you press the time. So why not have a clearinghouse of information where anyone can call us or uh, go and get some training to learn more about how to make their organization more accessible to people with disabilities? Um, I'm also envisioning a website um, which would have an access calendar, a listing of all the accessible spaces, a listing of the workshops and training and resources. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm happy to send this PowerPoint to, and to you, so you don't feel like you have to write notes, but just relax and enjoy the video experience. Uh, so, so good the experience. Um, and finally, equipment sharing. At some point, it would be great to have um, a repository of equipment because theaters, different theaters have different budgets. Some <coughs> can afford more equipment than others. Why not have an equipment sharing program where small black box theaters, for example, could fall from this um, repository and allow more diversity in their audiences? Um, so the consortium, I would like to see a steering committee, and this steering committee will be made of people who are passionate about the arts, and passionate about access, and passionate about seeing people of all disabilities access the arts. And so the role of that steering committee will be to guide the vision and the strategic planning of the consortium, to create these kinds of workshops. You know, we can't do it by ourselves. We need help doing this kind of thing. But the connection between the arts and disability communities, both membership and participation, so spreading the word. Uh, because there's so many arts organizations, not just in Seattle, but beyond, in King County as well. An advocate for universal access at cultural facilities. So, um, if we need you. So if you're interested, um, please contact me. Feel free to email me. Um, we can have a conversation about what that would look like, the kind of commitment. It's a volunteer opportunity, and hopefully your organization will support that kind of opportunity. So, today's workshop, I know you're dying to hear from our parents, so I'm going um, as fast as I can so that you can hear from these, what these people have to say. But today, I hope to have cultural administrators like yourself have a better understanding of people with disabilities live experiences accessing the arts. And secondly, um, get insights on how to engage people with disabilities in the arts. I've heard from many of you that um, 
it's hard to sometimes meet people with disabilities and find out more about what their needs are and what, um, what they hope to experience in the arts. So this is an opportunity to do to, to that. Guidelines for this. I want to make sure that you know that this is a safe space. Uh, we respect all efforts to work on accessibility issues in your organization. Um, the fact that you are here is a big deal. We recognize that each organization is at varying levels of accomplishment with accessibility. We're here to help you and not just. Questions. It's going to be an interesting format. You will have the opportunity to text questions to the number up on the screen. Or you can write an index card. And Lewis up here has copies of the index card. And if you want one, just raise your hand and drag them down. At any point, this is an informal discussion, so please feel free to add questions um, on no cards or texting. Um, you can direct the question to a particular panelist or um, to everyone, please indicate. And due to time constraints, we have a lot to cover. Please focus your questions on the lived experiences of our panelists, rather than general questions on possible solutions. So, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and get started um, with our questions. What we're going to do is um, go through some questions and maybe go back and forth with some audience questions, depending on what we get. Um, so the first question for all of you is, are you ready? <laughs> You're ready. All right. So the first question is, um, no, no, I'm, I'm doing the question. So please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. What are your hobbies? What, are, what is something surprising that people might not know about you? And I'm going to have Mason do read the bio of this person. Christiana Omsumner has been an intersectional disability justice advocate for over 15 years and carries his passion into the work as a consultant and community educator, organizer. They are the owner and principals of Euphanies of Equal Equity Education Consulting and co-chair for the Seattle Disabilities Commission and Renters Commission and founding ED of the Eleanor Elizabeth Institute of Black Empowerment. They are autistic with intersecting cognitive, chronic, and psychiatric disabilities. in artistic justice as a way to express my experience of living with uh, developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities. And it all came to a head when, in the beginning of my consulting business, I was a social impact consultant for the Seattle Opera and helped with um, inclusion of, um, of, in general, but especially for black folks. I guess some hobbies is I, I am an avid reader. I have an actual library in my house um, to the point that my friends ask me for books if I have them, and I often do. I like to watch a lot of uh, news and WWE on the television, and I, and I do. <coughs> um, and I guess a surprising fact about me is that I have I have done two things that I have not yet found someone else while I've been in Seattle for the last 10 years have done. I've won a national beauty pageant. Um, I was Mrs. American Beauty's National 2016. Um, and I have experienced every type of natural disaster that there is to experience, except for a tsunami and a sinkhole. So if you need to know, if you need some emergency management tips, I am kind of a doomsday prepper. I can give you tips. Camille Jasney has been dealing with various eye diseases, including diabetes, glaucoma, and coronary problems since the age of five, and lost her remaining sight in 2009. She started a low vision support group and an audio book club at the downtown library. Camille also is an 
outreach co-chair for the UW Eye Institute, and a spokesperson for Guide Dogs for the Blind and is involved in the Art Beyond Sight program, which provides free monthly tours for the blind and low vision communities at the Seattle Art Museum. Additionally, she is a tactile artist who creates paintings, collages, and unique flowers out of buttons and copper wire. So, what a privilege to be here today. Thank you all for coming today. Um, about me, I have my guide dog, Egan, here. So, it's not a surprise to anybody. You probably walked in and saw him here. He's four years old, and he just, he just got back from a cruise in the Caribbean, where he was the star. Everybody knew who he was, and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> so, he, and he did a really good job. He likes to hike and swim in the water when we get to a place where he can go play. Um, I have a wonderful family, really supportive. My dad and mom always said when I was growing up with lots of visual problems and spending a lot of time in the doctor's office, I'm not handicapped, I'm handicapable. And my shoulders are broad, that's why I can handle whatever happens to me. And all these little sayings that I actually keep on saying to my children, which say, Mom, it's enough already. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'd rather be positive than negative. And I love... Um, to be, I love music, I love theater, and I love art. And all my life I've, I've attended different various activities, but I, um, and, and I just find it to be so rewarding that there's actually places there to go to for people that are blind and low vision. Um, for me, people worry that I don't have a life. I have like almost too much going on. As my son said this morning, who's almost gonna have a baby any day with his wife, Mom, you gotta retire. You're gonna be a grandma. <laughs> so, but I also um, want something new, something that I've done that you might not know. I, I'm a collage artist and I made eight pictures for the Accessibility Awards at Microsoft last year. And that was a really big honor for me to be able to do. And I just got accepted for another program. It's called Sixth Sense in Chicago for people that are blind and low vision to create art. And they chose my one picture for the poster more than the other one for me to be able to send and sell. And I'm, we're going to go to Chicago, my husband and I, to celebrate this experience. Abby Lang, a deaf artist, is the executive director of Deaf Spotlight, which oversees artistic and cultural programming to support deaf artists in their work. Throughout her career, Patty has pursued opportunities that encourage the deaf community to embrace and celebrate the arts. She has a BFA in ceramics from the University of Washington and an MA in nonprofit management for the arts from New York University. She believes that everyone has the ability to create and express their story through the arts. Thank you. Let's see, people don't know that in my family, I have two other siblings that are also deaf. So the three of us are quite lucky to have each other because we were able to have communication access. Our parents took sign classes and they actually practically signed with us. So I'm, I'm pretty fortunate and I want to recognize that. Also, what I like to do with some hobbies, I like to travel. I like to meet lots of new people and learn different sign languages from other countries. Every country does have their own. Um, and also food and culture, history. Also, I'm, of course, I'm really lucky to live here in Seattle, so there's a really beautiful city and nature balance here. Um, I am looking forward to this panel, with these panels to discuss accessibility issues with you all. Laura A. Constable is currently a board member at both the Reed Foundation and Seattle Children's Theater. She was the first female president of Power 10 New York, and an, organizing devoted, an organization devoted to raising money for the U.S. rowing teams and was on the governing board of the Yale University Art Gallery. Laura was trip specialist for Backroads and ran Travel and Leisure magazines as one of the world's top travel operators. She holds a BA in Art History from Yale University and an MBA in Marketing from Columbia University and a post-baccalaureate certificate from NYU School of Philanthropy. Laura was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis in 2009. Hi, it's great to see some familiar faces, so I really do appreciate some familiar faces. Uh, as the new kid on the block here with this amazing panelist, um, I'm better known right now as, as a, a professional chauffeur for my 10-year-old. 
to uh, school and this game and that game. Um, but I'm also passionate about the arts. Uh, my first job out of college was Jenny Holzer's personal assistant and uh, artist assistant. And she represented the United States in the Venice Biennale. So first business trip was a month long, all expenses paid trip to Venice, which is not such a bad thing. Um, and now as things change and uh, we age gracefully or age in our own different ways, um, different challenges have uh, been presented in my life. Um, but I don't see them necessarily as challenges. And so, especially with my friends on the Children's Center board, uh, I'm hopefully going to try and show everybody that these tools that, that, we, that we may use um, to, for, for movement and for living aren't necessarily bar barriers or restrictions. They just really can allow everybody to live and move in different ways. And uh, let's see, another little known fact I love the sun. So hopefully spring will come to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no more snow days. <laughs> so that's Captain. What does accessibility in the arts mean to you? What does it look like or feel like? So let's start with. Come here. Start. <laughs> well, for me, accessibility means being able to go to either a theater or go to an art museum and, and, and e either with the um, theater have audio descriptive so I can know what's going on on stage. I love to go to theater. I don't love going with my husband where we whisper back and forth what's going on. It's just so, and I've been, at, we've been asked to be quiet. So I think the whole thing for me would be um, being like sitting there like everybody else enjoying the, what they're seeing. I'm hearing it with, and it makes, I can understand it. Um, the museum, I love going to the museum. Um, for me, again, I just got recently an iPhone and some of the, the, um, displays there, some of the current or maybe different pieces have some audio description to it. To me, just being included in what everybody else is doing is what I would love. I would like to be part of what everybody with sites can do. Ah, let's see. Accessibility for me uh, would be do the, everything that, well, and just as an aside, just because I'm sitting here, you may not see, I, I have lost a lot of the weakness on my left side of my body, so I use a cane, uh, and sometimes an electric stirrer. So in terms of what I would love for equal access is, um, I don't want to have any barriers. I would like to do the same thing as everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, separate entrances, in my mind, bring back images and, and policies of the Jim Crow era. Um, separate, it, sometimes you have to go around the side of the alley. Uh, Seattle's a little bit better than many cities. I grew up in New York City. Uh, the separate entrances are, are very common there for scooters and things. And uh, so I'd like to see those gone. Um, I'd love to outlaw revolving doors. Those are <laughs> particularly legal. Um, and I've had some choice words for people over the years for those. Uh, and I'd love to have the same amount of choice for seating options. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to take a scooter all the way to the top of that, that uh, this, the chair, the stadium seating, as opposed to always just be assumed that it's close is the best and easiest. Um, you know, when the last time everybody did go to Cinerama, I went, went, recently went there for a movie and sort of an aha moment. I think Cinerama's gonna be my new favorite, only movie theater in town, because you can walk in and and sit pretty much anywhere you'd like uh, with rooms and safely. I, ultimately, it's about fear for me. I, I don't want to fall, I don't want to hurt somebody else, and hopefully if, if safe places are safer and more accessible, uh, the fear element can be removed. Some of these questions that I prepared are a little theoretical, so bear with me, but uh, I just really want to like, lay out the answer to this question around accessibility. So when I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we talk about inclusivity, I always use the, um, the Up to My Ride as a metaphor. Uh, if any of you have seen that show, it's about an exhibit going and, and taking people and jumping cars, 
and then fixing them up and souping them up. And so I always say diversity is, is the outside, it's the paint job, it's the rims, it's, it's the chrome, it's everything that you see on the outside. It's when you have all of your photos or your website photos with a whole bunch of black people in it, right? And then in, inclusion is when you have, you try to get like a small sedan and expand it out so you can have 20 people in the hot tub. And so with inclusion, you are just trying to get as many people in as much as possible. But those people don't necessarily have the will nor do they actually have access to the engine. In Pit My Ride, the engines were, and things like the transmissions were actually never, um, or very rarely fixed. They just souped them up so they couldn't drive them. So if you try to have as much as inclusion as possible, that's great, but if they can't get access to actually drive the car or have access to have any input into where that car goes, then the inclusion actually doesn't matter. It's equity that matters. That I'm pretty sure is going to be the next question I'll talk about. Can you speak, um, Christiana, can you speak from your experience what it looks like for you personally when you go to some arts event? Yeah, I mean, I think that, especially coming from the disabilities that I have, there's, is there certain inclusions that people try to have, like lighting, um, perhaps. Um, you know, I think I am coming from things a little differently in that the diagnoses that I have are usually not what people think about with disability inclusion, which is a whole other issue that I think people need to remember, that the ADA goes beyond sensory and physical disability. Um, as for inclusion, to be completely honest, the reason why I share it in the way that I do is because very rarely do I see inclusive factors for folks with developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities. Um, I, when I'm a consultant, I see a lot of people who say, well, let's make sure that we have wheelchair ramps, which is important. Let's make that we have braille on the elevator buttons, which is extremely important. But how, how many times do you hear someone say, let's check for ambient noise? Let's make sure that we have soundproof walls for folks who, um, who have internal stimuli. Let's make sure that there's not too much overhead fluorescent lighting. Um, I can't give a example of a place that was fully inclusive, especially being an intersectional meeting, and what it means for me to have developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities and to live them as such out loud um, with the rest of the identities I hold, like my race and my gender. Thank you. Okay. So the deaf community is a linguistic and cultural minority. So that means all of the majority is hearing people and so they talk and they focus on one's ability to hear or speak while the deaf community doesn't have access to that information. So of course they use their eyes and they sign with each other. So as for myself, for access going into a museum, I can't see the things around, right? I am a sighted person, I can read that, but I didn't realize that if you do have a QR code or something on your phone, you can get an audio description, getting the story about the artwork. I don't have access to that extra information. Sometimes I do ask them if they do have a transcript of that information, but then it's a lot of information to go through, reading both the information about the artist itself, the piece, and then the backstory. And as far as access to films, yeah, so, so of course I like to be independent and then if I can watch some films as I go through an art exhibit um, and theater accessibility with that. There are lots of cool, uh, more and more shows, they are providing sign language interpreters there, they stand there on the stage. So I can watch the plays as well as the, the interpreters, but again it's not 100% access to that art because I want to see deaf actors on the stage within the plays themselves not through a third person, through the interpreter. <coughs> I would like to see deaf actors do their direct sign translation, their expression about a deaf vantage character, their stories, not a translation through a hearing interpreter. And also, often, accessibility to me means, uh, I, I would actually like to see other people like me in that space that I can interact with. Direct, yeah, so, if there are some networking opportunities. And as far as theater, right, so there are some actors there. Maybe if I could also meet some admin or some staff who know sign language in the theaters, so that I can have a more direct connection with them. Um, also, I really just don't want any language barriers, so. I'd like to add a little bit about my own experience. Um, 
Well, so Patty and I are both that, but Patty relies on um, ASL as a primary means of communication, and I rely on lip reading and speaking. And so that, the point I would like to make is that everybody has the same kind of needs. So um, someone who is blind may have a different need than someone who is low vision, for example. And someone um, who signs has a different need than someone who doesn't sign. So it's really important to meet the person where they're at and get to know that person and not make assumptions. Um, so for me, accessibility um, may not be the same thing that it is for Patty. For example, I rely on captioning. Um, I don't sign myself, so signing um, I wouldn't be able to understand. I also like hearing loops um, because I wear a cochlear implant, um, and so I really appreciate the hearing loops because it really helps me hear the voices much better, so I don't have to completely rely on captioning. Um, and I wanted to point out also that we have several different um, accessibility um, methods that we're using in this room. We have interpreting right here, um, we have uh, captioning here, um, we have, um, we have uh, accessible ramps to get into the space, um, and we, we have a loop in the space, thank you, Bob. We have a loop in this space. Um, is anybody using an assistive listening device? Yeah, so um, we have assistive listening devices here, if you did not know. Um, so there's many different ways of making um, this space accessible. Um, for me, though, I, I really like sitting near the front of the stage so that I can lift me um, as well as seeing the captains. Because if I'm too far away, then I have to look at the captains. And I really like seeing the whole um, verbal and non-verbal expression of the actor. So it's important for me to be able to sit up close. But often that's prohibitive in terms of cost. Um, so when I was growing up, I would use scripts and I would use um, a pen flashlight to follow along. And I would get a lot of comments from people around me, even the ushers, who would say, please put that away, it's bothering the patrons, which may or may not have been true. Um, but because these people didn't have uh, the understanding or awareness of what my needs were, it was often difficult. But now that captioning is here, I really have to use the script anymore. Any other um, additions before we move on? I would just say that yeah, while it's important to understand that there are very uh, different needs amongst a lot of these communities, there are some that are usable for everybody. Like the ramp, the ramp is great for mm -hmm. um, Camille and the dog, and it's good for walkers and wheelchairs. It's, it's good for moms and strollers, and, mm -hmm. and um, so just when people start thinking about cost or complaining, oh, this would be expensive. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of these things that are quote unquote ADA compliant or ADA necessary or potentially perceived as only for a narrow subset of, of patrons, um, I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. But these tools can be useful for by many more. I would like to remind people, um, if you look at the screen, you can text questions anytime um, or ask Lewis for an index card if you have a question. So raise your hand and he will come and um, give you a um, card. All right, next question. So we could probably spend all day on this question, so I'm going to do my best to keep it um, concise as possible. What does equity in the arts relating to disability, race, sexual orientation, even class mean to you? Particularly in the arts, equity in the arts. Let's start with Penn. Let's see, I'm just thinking that's quite a big topic. Um, I think right now, the word intersectionality is really hot right now because we are noticing a person and they're layering with themselves and their cultural identities. It's not really just one thing like, oh, here's, here's just one type of person. 
there's their path and their journey to consider and how they got to their current point. So for myself, I'm an Asian deaf woman. Okay, I I'm also an academic, and so my my life experience is different than anyone else I've ever met. Nobody has my experience. Um, so when I consider how to make something equitable, right? I think an equitable working space or some type of performance or event space. I think they should hire different levels of folks, not just artists, but also staff and admin, and also funders as well, grant sponsors, etc. So it's not just the talent that they look at, right? It's, you know, they need to look at smaller companies, maybe nonprofits or other organizations, or even if it is just a small group that is a nonprofit, right? Just allow them to grow their work, grow their brand, and to represent their different views that exist. So I guess that's, that's it in, in a nutshell. So there's two ways of looking at equity. And, and for me, equity is, and I'm happy to go after what Patty has said because it's, it's very much the same. Um, equity is not going to be equity until I see people who look like myself in the organization. And <coughs> you talk a lot of, and there's two different ways you can look at it. With equity versus equality, I would say equality is when your organization matches the demographics of your surrounding community exactly. Equity is when your organization exceeds the demographics of your surrounding community exactly. If you also want to look at it the other way, I'm also a nerd and academic, if you haven't heard those two, so it's gonna be sitting next to each other. But the social theory of critical mass or the percentage of people you need of a specific identity to change the culture of an organization is 26%. So let's just let's just work on like disabled black folks. Raise your hand if your organization has 26% of your organization has disabled black folks in it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, no one just raised their hand. Yeah. So um, equity along the lines of how I come in as a patron is going to be impossible if there's not people who look like me at every step of the way. That is helping your organization drive that change and that innovation forward. So people who look like me or people who look like all of us really need to be in your ticketing office. They need to be who is curating your art, or who is in your, um, who's, who's doing your casting. You need to have people who look like us, who are your stage directors, who are backstage, who is your, in your staff, who's in your executive leadership, who's in your board of directors. You, you need these people to be there because you can't, you, you cannot speak on behalf of us. One of the biggest phrases that you hear in disability justice is nothing about us without us. So I, so in order for this, for me to even speak on how I can be um, experience equity in the organization as a patron, I would first want to ask you as a patron, what are you doing to represent equity in the organization? I will in no way be as eloquent as Christiana or Patty, so I'm not even gonna try. The two things I would like to highlight though is um, the notion of proximity. Um, I think that if the most important thing in my mind is, is having somebody at the table to help make a decision or, or just make a design, um, it's hard to, if you assume you make an ass out of you and me, period. <laughs> um, so if, you, if you're trying to um, make changes without knowing firsthand from a patron or a staff member with an issue, I, I, it's, it's just short-sighted and it may come back to haunt you, or you may have to do any rework it going forward. Um, and the only other thing I would point out is that the disabled population, specifically in Washington State, is growing by leaps and bounds every year. Um, the latest figure I looked at, um, right now 13% of Washington State residents are disabled in some, in some way, and 40% of people over 65 are disabled. So um, from the business standpoint, there's a lot of money being left on the table uh, if, if you cannot accommodate uh, a, a broad, like the broadest range of patrons. So my comment would be about people who are unable to afford to go to events, because I think that's really challenging. That just eliminates 
a big population. I think there's many organizations that actually have a, for a free day, a free, a, free, a free time for people to go to the museums or what have you. But it, it would be wonderful to, to create more of an open door situation for people, um, people with disabilities, but who can't afford to go to these events. Um, somehow uh, charge less, somehow be able to accommodate their needs. I mean, it's a really exciting feeling when you're somewhere and you're amongst people who possibly may never get to go to a museum, and yet they, this once a month they get the opportunity to go in and feel the experience that everybody else does. So um, my goal would be to see more people have accessible entrances as far as getting into events like theater and museum, so that they don't they don't feel like they're they're isolated. It's it's terrible to be left out of what activities there are because of price. A lot of it, these events are really prohibited, so it's hard for them to afford it. No, I'd like to. Uh, yeah, I actually would like to add something. You know, if you do have some events, you can try to ad advertise people, but then what happens if they don't come? Yeah. Right? And it's because you're not reaching the right people with your advertising. You don't know who to reach out to. So all of your efforts are kind of wasted, right? So who are you actually including within your service? Some people don't have the opportunity to work, even, or experience even just applying for that specific opportunity because they might have a skill or the opportunity without the professional development for them. So we, so, so we also need to have these workshops, some formal teaching. It's a, that's just not historically been accessible to people with disabilities. So you have to consider that as well. And also they might not feel welcome to any other type of event, just based on how they were treated before. So again, you really have to think about what's happening on the other side of the fence. Thank you. I wanted to add that, um, just to cut the booms up, um, you know, um, the sentiment that um, when you talk about equity and equality, how, what is the difference between that? And I wanted to show you this um, slide that I found was very interesting. Um, you can assume that everybody can get the right, the same kind of access, they'll be able to go in and enjoy the experience. So I'm going to describe this for Camille so that she knows what's up there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so equality versus equity. So the first half of the image under equality, you have three people um, who are trying to see a game and there's a fence in front of them. And um, all three people have a box that they can stand up on to peer over the fence. And two people have a box that they can use to peer up over the fence. But the third person is in a wheelchair and has been given a box. But obviously, um, that's an equal way of treating people. You give them all the same thing, but does it work for everybody? No, obviously it's not going to work for the wheelchair, person in the wheelchair. On the other half of the image is equity. So you have three people who have been given three different types of things to ensure that they can see the game. The first person is tall enough, they can see over the fence. The second person is standing on two boxes, she can see over the fence. And the third person who's in the wheelchair is using a ramp to get up to see over the fence. So basically, um, you can give um, that you can give people uh, access, but you may have to adjust for the kind of access that that person needs, and that's what equity is all about. Um, and making assumptions, as someone said earlier, can be detrimental to the progress of a teaching. For example, um, oftentimes when I go to the theater, I get people signing to me. Um, and I even, I know I sound different when I open my mouth. Um, but people start signing to me and, and, I, and it, it befuddles me because I'm not signing to them. So why are they signing to me? So um, it's a very interesting um, philosophical question for me. And so depending on my mood that day, I can't be explained that I don't sound. And sometimes I actually say, um, actually, I don't really understand what you're saying. I do know a few signs that there's trouble, that's all I know. Uh, so 
with that said, I think that this is an interesting um, conversation to be had um, about the staff at organizations like Christiana said. You know, what, what, what is your staff made up of? Who's, who is representative of, uh, of the community? Anything else you want to add? I'm just going to, can I add one thing? I just noticed yeah. um, on, on one of the news, on one of the radio stations, they were advertising that they were doing American Sign Language for one of the plays. And I, I kind of thought about you, Elizabeth, you don't do signing. I don't do Braille. It's everybody assumes assumes that there's certain if you have a d disability that you're all the same. But exactly, I remember when I was in graduate school, and a friend of mine was telling me that he went home to tell his parents that he met this really cool woman who um, happened to be deaf, and the parents said, "Does she know Braille?" <laughs> 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 I mean, just that happened. Um, I think we have one question so far that's coming from the audience. Uh, uh, this is the first of three questions, but I'll just go ahead and ask the first one first. Um, this question asks, what is your favorite accessibility arts venue in the area and who's doing it well? And I would like to add a piece to that too. Um, what indicators in a venue, this is coming from a venue's point of view, are there that, that make you feel like at home? What, what things do we do well to allow access to the theater? Or to anything? I'd like to answer that. Oh, great, this Yeah, I was going to say that's a very similar question to what I was going to ask. Or that um, what did the, the idea of cultural experience look like for you? So in, along, along the same line with that. You know, when you go into a venue and it's working well and it's going, what, what does that look like? What does that feel like when it's the idea of cultural experience for you? Go ahead, me. Okay, well, I just want to thank Kelsey Donahue for being here from the Seattle Art Museum because um, what they have done for the <coughs> on site program has been really terrific and they've had lots of people come and observe what we do and as well for what they do there. The docents are describing art to blind and low vision people. Um, they make accommodations that they, if you can't, if you take access, they'll actually meet you outside the door to help you in, or they wait at the front door for you so you're not afraid to get in and they'll walk you to the room. We all meet together and then we all go as a group and docents work with us as far as making sure we are of a sighted guide and they know the language, like, it's not over here or over there. It's like they describe it so we can actually understand. So I, I have to thank Kelsey for, for what they've done at the Seattle Art Museum. And it's been terrific. Um, also, the uh, downtown library at Clio and CJ are here from the Library Equal Access Program. But we started the book group there, and it, they've accommodated our needs totally. We, we all sit in a group, we listen, we all talk about the same book we've all listened to, and they make sure we get to whatever, get access home or taxi home, or they walk us across the street and we go and have our, our lunch together as a group. So there's um, two places I've really found that have been really accommodating our needs. It's been a wonderful experience. My favorite art venue has great parking and lots of bathrooms that are very close to the parking. <laughs> um, it may sound silly, but one of the key tenets in the ADA regulations do involve uh, access to restrooms. Um, and so those are my two favorites. Uh, the other key thing for me personally uh, to feel safe are handrails. Um, so. Uh, my favorite venues uh, have handrails and, um, and information. Um, and to what, something to, uh, to which I referred to earlier, uh, the ability to allow me to choose where I want to sit and I'm not just pegged into one particular place. Um, so technically, again, the ADA regulations say that, state that all price points should be available and accessible um, as needed. and. Um, based on age of venues, it, it might not necessarily happen, but that would be great for me. I 
I'm sitting here trying to think of like a specific venue, and it's not necessarily that there's specific venues that's been accessible, but that there's been a specific programming or uh, organizers or curators or folks who have made it <coughs> more accessible. And you can kind of tell um, based on who is overseeing an event within one space because the lighting will be different. They may or may not use strobe lights. Um, you know, there's just little things like that you can tell that someone thought um, about, you know, folks with uh, developmental cognitive and psychiatric disability. And it, what's interesting, especially because we're at a four culture event, I think the most accessible, one of the most accessible um, art uh, installations I went to was actually earlier this month at the TK Artist Walks in one of their artistic spaces and how they curated it was um, look not only to the lighting and making sure that there was not as much ambient noise but also to have essentially like a stimming table um, for folks like me like waiting for the show to start there was collage there play-doh and things like that um, there was either pillows to sit on the floor or chairs or open space for wheelchairs um, and as one of the people who wanted to perform, they made sure to check in with me, not only whether or not I had all the tools I needed to perform, but whether or not I had the spoons to go at my place on the set list, and was open to changing the set list in case I was becoming fatigued or overstimulated. So for me, that was extremely accessible, and it was a great space. Um, what, what I had originally prepared for the, this one question was just, I think it's very important in arts when you're talking about accessibility to also think about this intersectionally. Like you're gonna hear me say intersectionality a lot and cultural humility. And so like think about safety, not just real safety, but perceived safety. And, for, and like safety from all the way from like whether or not someone feels safe to buy a ticket and even enter into your space to like whether someone feels safe asking for help finding their seat, whether someone feels safe buying wine in a mission, whether someone feels safe waiting for an Uber outside without getting an, a, approached or accosted. These are all things around safety and especially things like bathrooms, coat check, you know, all these different places where you have to interact with people, really think about safety, both real and perceived, and find ways to address those issues if you find um, a, Places for improvement in that. I think for me, I don't think I've yet found the right venue as far as accessibility goes because not all provide sign language interpreters. So that means I can't go to any event anywhere at any time. Like other people have to follow a schedule like this. So I have to follow other people's, you know, whatever they perceive as a good time for deaf people to go, I have to follow that. It would be nice if I could just show up and have the interpreters ready, or even captioning ready. And I could just turn them on, sure, no problem, without any, um, without any apologies or resistance from the venue itself. And, and, and also the, the price point, I think they can budget in access, you know, for interpreters that are captioning, etc. And also installing ramps to, and handrails to make sure that their spaces are accessible. If you do that in the beginning, they don't have to think about it later when it comes up, right? They don't have to, it's not going to be an aftermath type of thing. Oh, sorry, we'll be sure to do it next time. Or sorry, we don't have the budget. Of course, that's frustrating. And I also then have to make sure I have the time to explain to upper management or the person who is planning this event to say, well, if you look at the budget costs, etc. It's something that they have to learn the vocabulary, the numbers, etc. They have to build this into their budget. That way, you then know how to ask them, and you can have that kind of dialogue with them. I think it would be nice to just not have to make that type of a decision every day, right? Just kind of focus on the experience of the art and the culture that's happening. How about I add um, the piece about the budget is so important, I think. Um, if artists were sort of um, subsumed by the budget, you know, um, if you just plan for accessibility within your budget, then you say, well, um, But I think that funders um, are slowly starting to come around to the idea of um, 
that it would be good to pay for these things, pay for accessibility. So I think we still have some work to do when it comes to educating donors and um, patrons of the arts about that sort of thing. Also, I want to um, make the point that um, accessibility doesn't just begin once you walk in the door. It happens before that. So um, take, for example, someone who's blind and living by themselves or someone who's low income. How are they going to get from point A to point B? How are they going to get from um, their home to the theater? There has to be a way of um, helping them get transport, for example. So um, thinking about accessibility outside the door is also important. I would also just I just also want to add to, um, and this is the consultant in me coming out, right? So, I would say that if you're, if you're, I, I would argue, I would empathetically, directly argue with you that um, if you have concerns around whether or not you have budget item uh, for accessibility, that is saying a lot about uh, the, the the culture of your organization. It is um, showing a lot about how your organization views uh, people with disabilities um, and <coughs> to the extent that they are prioritized in your uh, strategic or business plan and, um, and not really well. And it would be something that as a consultant I would come in and perhaps see to what extent that is pervasive and work on cultural humility models so that people can see accessibility as an intrinsic part of your organization and, and the arts and not something that has to be accommodated on the back end. Um, and that sort of unconscious, you know, definitely likely unconscious implicit bias, um, not intentional, not saying that you're waking up every day saying like, ooh, how can I keep the disabled people out of my space today, but that it's something that's happening. And I would just argue if you're sitting here um, fretting oh my goodness, but do we have the money to make this more accessible? I would say, I would ask yourself um, to find the core why of that concern. Uh, I think this is a workshop in and of itself. Um, this is a very important topic, and I think one that is burning and most of the So, um, I mean, it's just tacked it just a little bit. Um, Next question, I think, is an important one, kind of related to all this language and how we refer to ourselves is important. Some people um, are unsure what to say or how to refer to disabilities. How do you refer to yourself when it comes to your disability? And what do people get wrong about your disability? Let's start with Laura this time. This is actually a little bit of a hard one for me because I'm still, even though this has been going on for 10 years for me personally, I still don't necessarily know what, I don't I usually like labels. Um, I tend to be very self-deprecating because I want people to feel at ease. I, I, carry, I carry a weapon, I carry a stick, I'm, I'm in a, 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 a machine sometimes that people aren't familiar with and, and I don't, um, and when I was in, in the scooter, I had a young child, so it was, it was important to me to make sure everybody felt comfortable. Um, and I'm also very tall, and uh, so it was important to me to make people feel at ease. So I personally am not necessarily the best person to talk to about this right now, um, but I do understand that, again, these tools that make movement in our lives easier for us may be perceived differently to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people come up to me and they say, oh, are you training this dog for some blind person? And I'll say, I am the person who's blind. <laughs> like, no, you're not. You don't look blind. And I go, what does blind look like? So I think it's interesting because um, I prefer not, I don't mind saying I'm blind. I have no problem with that. I, I, mean, I used to be called, I used to say I was visually challenged. And I still have visually challenged, but now I'm actually with less sight, so I am blind. And um, you know, and then people get really uncomfortable. I'll go to a store and I'll, I'll be, with, I'll ask them a question, and then I'll say, "Are, are you, are, are you standing in front of me?" And they'll look at me, and go, "Yes," 
and I'll say, well, okay, because I can't see. So, I mean, I, I try really hard not to make it hard on people, though. I, I kind of really think it's important for people to know. So when they think I'm blind and find out I'm blind, when they find out I'm blind, I tell them what my needs are. I have no problem telling people what I, they can do to help me so that I'm more comfortable in, in the space I'm in. So. I have no problem with that. And I think Egan's a dead giveaway. Although every time I go to a restaurant with my husband or my family, they go, is that a working dog? I go, yeah, this is a real one. <laughs> <laughs> do people tend to talk louder to you when they find out you're blind? Oh, totally. And then they talk to my husband. <laughs> they ask him, my husband a question, would she like a braille menu? Or they'll say something like that, and I'll say, no, I don't, thank you. And they'll hand me a menu, and I'll say, here, I don't really need it, but I'm a good eater. I try really hard to help people out. Um, and people who know me when I go to a restaurant or somewhere in our neighborhood, they're really great. They'll put, they'll say the water's right in front of you, or you know, they'll make comments to help me. But um, most people don't get it until they notice that um, I don't, that I'm like, well, I, I, I eat pretty good. I've learned how to eat with a knife and a fork, and I think it still have things come off my plate. But I think I'm, I do pretty well as being a blind person. I'm getting it. <laughs> oh, um, sorry, I thought you were going to go quick. Okay. Um, I do think it's important to study different disability terms. That's important just to have it in your head and not label other people, let them label themselves. So, for example, there are some times, like when I go to the airport, okay, and so I go and I check in. And they say, oh, you're a deaf person. And without my knowledge, they put, they say that I'm disabled uh, on my ticket. And then there's going to be another person on the other side, and they have a wheelchair. And they try to make it. And it's like, hey, you know, there's, there are some deaf people with other disabilities that do use wheelchairs. But again, they never ask me if I want it or not. They could check in and see if I want a wheelchair or not. And then I can answer, no, I can walk myself. So something else, another situation, going into a store. Again, let me identify myself with a certain term of vocabulary and take out that attitude or a certain stereotype that you might carry. Because every person that comes up to me, they, right, I, I, I'm a person who signs, when I start signing with them, they say, oh, I'm so sorry. There's, there's, so, many, there's, so, much pity. there's so much pity. They, they, they feel helpless because they don't know sign and they communicate with me. And that's important to throw that out and just see how they can communicate with me in that moment. We can text, we can write back and forth, etc. Instead, you know, I want them to see me as an equal. Yeah, um, I think it's United Airlines is the one that does the wheelchair. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, United Airlines. Just have it around my bunch. When they go flying, a uh, bunch will adapt. And United Airlines, they come out as they're walking out with a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty funny, they send a text of themselves sitting in the wheelchair. <laughs> 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 um, I wanted to um, point out um, here are some um, news and, yeah, um, oh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, okay, so um, I think what I want to preface this with is that you're hearing me talk a lot about cognitive, developmental, and psychiatric disability. And I actually have co-occurring disabilities. So I have chronic disabilities um, that affect my, the, the way that I move about the world and my body. Um, I have physical disabilities that you can't really see today's a good day and I don't have my cane. Um, but what has affected my life the most were those three, those developmental, cognitive, and psychiatric disabilities um, what I think is important to, in, in saying that is that it's contextual. And so uh, contextual in this idea that I was still trying to grapple when I was thinking about this question. So I might say, I'm autistic. I'm an autistic person. But I'm not going to say I'm schizoaffective. I, I don't know why. I might say I, have, I live with schizoaffective disorder. Um, you know, I don't call myself DID, you know, which is a, 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 a what the ID stands It's a dissociative, is what it was, dissociative identity disorder. I'm not gonna say like, I'm a dissociative. I just say, 
I live with a social identity disorder. And I was asking my husband, we met at the Peer Counselor Conference for people with disabilities, and I asked, do you consider yourself an epileptic or that you live with epilepsy? And he said, it depends on the day. And we had this conversation around like, perhaps the change is based on our relationship with it. And so in like, the, in like a 10 second synopsis, there are two different models of disability, the medical and social model of disability. And essentially the medical model says that the person is disabled and the world accommodates them. And the social model of disability says, disability is something that happens to the person and society is accessible to them. And I think it's in that relationship of the social model that I make that choice day to day. So I don't know if it's psychosocial for me. I don't know if it's socially political. I don't know if it's because I feel like, especially as a black femme presenting person, people would hold that I'm autistic or that I have a learning disability more than they would hold that I'm schizoaffective or that I have dissociative identity disorder. Um, but I do think it's important to ask and be um, in a cons what I call cultural consent uh, conversation, which means you can ask them the question, but you also have to allow them to consent to have a conversation about their cultural identity with you. And if they choose not to, you have to respect that. Um, and I think that that would be the best thing, but the biggest thing that people get wrong about me is number one, yes, black autistic people exist. Um, number two, I can be schizoaffective and know I'm not gonna hurt you. Sybil is wrong, so is when we flew over to Cuckoo's Nest. And like none of it is true, um, so not really. And so I would just say also uh, check your bias. Um, check how much your bias is based in uh, sensationalized movies. Um, we have not done a very good job of not showing stereotypes, especially of cognitive uh, developmental and especially psychiatric disability. Um, but uh, don't assume, but please do check your bias. Um, and I, I guess finally, just know that body language is about 90% of your communication. Um, so it's not about saying the right things. I can tell when people uh, strip away. I can tell if I'm dysregulated or if I uh, just slip up and have a response to internal stimuli and how people act. And I'll just end with this. Um, there are a lot of other things that are happening in this world with folks like myself. And there's a lot of people who see me talk and they say, wow, but you must be one of the good ones. Also don't assume people's backgrounds. Um, I spent over seven years of my life in involuntary psychiatric treatment. Three of those being in an asylum, five of those being in a social program that conditioned me into being able to do this. So just because of that, I just want to let you know. I say that because also don't assume background. So just because you hear that, don't assume that someone is one of the good ones or if they're so high functioning or they're well performing. I think that's the biggest thing people get wrong about all people psychiatric. Thank you. I think that um, the many disabilities that are invisible. Um, for example, my disability, you would never know that I was deaf until I opened my mouth. Um, and um, I, can, I can't tell you how many times people steer the conversation through my deafness. And I don't necessarily want to talk about it all the time. So like um, Christiana was saying, it just depends on the day. Of depends on how I'm feeling, but I feel like shown. But I don't, I personally don't identify as someone with dis disability first. I am a professional woman, I'm a mother, um, I am a public health professional, I'm a writer, I'm, um, I'm a competing triathlon. No, there's so much more to me than just my deafness. So, um, so it's, okay, it's important to meet the person where, where, you, where they're at. Um, so take a look at this um, screen here and just um, just get some ideas of how you might think about referring to someone. And this is not an exhaustive list. Everyone has their own way of calling themselves certain terms. Um, so this is, this is not meant to be the all and be and, and all. So I want to switch to um, Daniela. She has a question for me. Um, so this question says, having representation in a space is incredibly important to increasing equity in an organization. But organizations can't hire diverse populations if not everyone feels they have access to even apply. 
In your experience, what are some factors or strategies you have encountered that made you feel actually welcome to apply for a job or experience? Number one, there are a lot of coded language that I can speak for myself and the folks that I've worked with, especially in Disabilities Commission and my constituents. There's a lot of coded language that make people go away. Like, for example, I don't know if you know of a lot of people um, across the spectrum of like cognitive developmental, neurological, psychiatric, a lot of us can't get driver's licenses because there are certain parts of our disability that prevents us from getting driver's licenses. So if you, if you have as a requirement that someone needs to have a driver's license and you read the job, the job duties and you don't actually need one, but it's for whatever reason you have, then that's gonna be the number one red flag. Um, you also have to remember that a lot of folks come from this uh, sort of uh, imposter syndrome. So they're already, you know, a, a lot of folks who come from sort of social oppression um, already feel like they're at a lack. And so I would say that having specific programs and initiatives that reach out to the to people that you need um, is important. I know that a lot of you are probably 501c3s and can't do political advocacy, but I will say that you know Washington State, for example, does have a state law against affirmative action that's being um, discussed in the state legislature right now. I mean, if you feel that you would need something like that, find a way um, in your free time or through a partnership with a non 501 c 3 to do that. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, it also might come down to what is the narrative of your organization? What is your organizational narrative putting out to the, so to, to the community? What is the social impact of what you have, not just what you're doing, but what you have done? Um, because if you're also not looking at it, um, not just um, how do we be, be competent, in helping bring folks into the organization, but also what is it about us that we can change or innovate or transform so that we can uh, not just attract people like, like flies to honey, but that it is a space that people would like to come to. I think those would be your best options for bringing those sort of people in. And you need to hire a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to acknowledge that um, having worked at nonprofits in the past, um, I know exactly just how much free time you have every day, and that you're bored, and uh, you need something else for your list uh, to do with. Um, it's it's not tricky. It's it's really a tricky thing, and hopefully at some point um, there will be extra a little bit of time to make the effort to go out and try and find a new candidate pool um, because it's it's easy if, if a resume lands on your desk and they're they're qualified task I've done. Um, it uh, and so I I, I appreciate the, the 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 time limitations and the small budgets. Um, but to Christiana's point, if it's if it's important to the organization, you'll, you'll find you'll find a way, and it, and it shows. It shows in the programming. It shows in the number of people that will come and find out about your events. And and I think in the end of the day, the institution will be a stronger institution. Um, I've been thinking about this. Well, I would say if you do hire somebody that would be in the organization. Um, be sure to understand their needs because I've been on boards before where everybody got all the paperwork information and that's something that I can't read. So when I was low vision, it would be fine print and I'd have to ask for it in large print. So I would say if you do hire somebody um, for whatever their, their needs are, accommodate them so that they feel like they're welcome and they can also go out in the public and invite other people with special needs. This is actually kind of related to this last topic that we had. So 
again, if you don't consider people with disabilities as your educators, we are not your teachers, okay? When you do want to hire someone else, do your own homework. Don't assume they're ready. You can hire a consultant, other people as well, and discuss with them and see what are the right phraseology, the, the, the um, appropriate definitions that you want to include within the organization with. So, so, so right, you, you want people of color to come to your organization, but why? Do you want to actually better your organization or do you just want their money? Do you want the, to satisfy the bug where buzzword of diversity, you really have to consider your intention behind it at first. So don't just hire someone and then put all of the work on their shoulders because they happen to be a member of that community. It's not fair to that person. They just want to do their job. They don't want to focus on their race, gender, etc., anything like that, including disability status. So again, it does depend on the organization because my, uh, my organization is called Deaf Spotlight. And it is a deaf-centered organization that focuses on sign language, its culture, and we are thinking about making accessible events. And so we're talking about the venues. It's important to have these discussions way ahead of time to make sure that we also secure deaf-blind interpreters for other members of our communities without them requesting it necessarily. So we just have the interpreters ready in case the need does come up. So then if a deaf-blind person does show up, we have that access for them. So again, we want to consider everything in beforehand to just make sure that we've covered all of our bases. And, and of course, like right in the middle, right in the thick of the planning process, we have to consider that first, and then it will come um, with the programming. Uh, first of all, excellent presentation. What advice would you give to arts educators working with children and teens? What do you wish would have been different when you were young and first discovered the arts? I'm going to start with that. Okay. Well, for me, as a child, as a young person going to activities, of course I would love to have audio description then. This is so new, it's happening more and more. Um, I would like that to be limited to just one one play, if it's a play. Or um, I, I would like to have more accessibility as a child, though I had not, I, nobody accommodated me when I was in school. So I think that for me, I think now there is much more awareness. It's getting a lot better. Um, I would like to just see it continuing so that nobody feels left out. I, I really feel that um, for your, as a young person going through visual problems, even my peers did not get what I was dealing with. I, I really felt that it's a, don't, nobody wants to feel so different. So I think I would like to see more um, doors open for people with all kinds of disabilities. And I'd love to see when you go into a theater, there would be someone in a wheelchair or a science, someone in science and closed caption. I mean, all of that audio description, I'd like to see it all. The more the, more the arts are accessible to everybody, I think that will help us all grow up and expand our minds. Um, my son, for example, has, has never known anything different. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm his mom. I'm not a disabled person. I'm not a this, I'm not a that. Uh, he's, we've lived together in the same house. And, and so if these venues provide access to everybody, then again, it's the, prox it's the proximity con uh, comment. I think that will help these kids recognize that we are we're all the same, we are all unequal. The, the equality versus equity, that, that it truly is an equitable uh, society, um, and that each institution can achieve that once at a time. This is a hard question, because um, I, I keep trying to think about how to, how to phrase it, but you know, just for context, I grew up in the from the mid eighties to mid nineties and early aughts, and so that's like post racial society, meant pre Obama time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a oh sorry post uh, post racial society meant pre Obama era. Um, so what's difficult about answering the question is that it really was an intersectional issue for me. 
Um, not only was I disabled and I was a black child, which especially autistic back with a, with, a, with a single young mom with state insurance that didn't cover ABA board certified specialists um, to get me the help that I needed, um, who was going through all of these different sort of things, and she was also poor. So there was a lot of those sort of arts um, things that I only experienced if it was like part of the field trip at school. Um, and even then, what I would say I really wish I had as a kid was representation. Um, and not just representation of people who um, had disabilities, but people like me who had disabilities who were in a positive way. Because it was already hard enough um, as a black girl to, to find representation of me that wasn't either, what do they say, like police poverty or pills. Um, like those are really like the three themes of people who look like me in all arts. Um, maybe I might see something with, with a nice, with a, with, without some of that, like dream girls, um, but still there's poverty and pills in that too. Um, you know, so there's Porgy and Bess, but then there's all of that going on. Um, there's a lot of this sort of stuff. So I, I would love to see like a black skit to affect a woman like doing the dang thing, going out, living their life without ending up like with some sort of like breakdown or some sort of traumatic, dramatic thing. Um, and that might mean bringing in more screenwriters or, or, or librettists or, or whatever that may be, artists um, that look like me or have come from my lens, but that would really be the most thing is representation. I think it's important to have more role models. Right, that actually look like us, folks with disabilities and the intersection that comes with that. And I noticed that there might not be enough representation out there in the media and movies because nobody gives these people these opportunities to be role models. So I think it's nice we have a school, our institute, museums, et cetera, we could all partner together and perhaps hire people who are artists with disabilities that can actually teach others art and just be there in that role while also having disabilities. So it could also be like dancing for classes for folks who use wheelchairs, right? Something like that, right? You know, instead of saying that people can't dance because they because they use canes, because they use walkers, because they use wheelchairs, we can just create these spaces and have these role models for these uh, kids. So I think it's important. Again, early exposure, positive role models, etc. I think it's going to be much more acceptable that way instead of putting folks in the corners and isolate them. And I think it's important, the more exposure we have, the more we see them thinking, oh, right, I do remember I saw that dancer in a wheelchair, that's cool, we should have them come and teach again, or I'd love to collaborate with them later. Maybe they could become a leader for this other project I'm working on. Instead of, you know, other folks with disabilities, they could be our future leaders as well in the arts communities. So I think about this question a lot because I'm a mom of two deaf children, um, but my kids have cochlear implants. And when I was growing up, cochlear implants were not um, common. And I grew up with hearing aids and have very um, much less access to sound than my kids have. So I was lucky though, I had a mother and a father who advocated for me. And so, um, I'm fortunate in that way, and I think um, advocacy is a really important thing to um, consider. One in five Americans has a disability, so anything you can do to advocate for a friend or a family member or you know, anyone you know who has a disability can go a long way. And so I spend a lot of my time advocating for my kids, for their education, for their um, success in life, and they hear way better than me. They can overhear, they can talk about me, you know, behind my back. <laughs> nothing, nothing to do with their death, which is to do with being teenagers. But, um, but they, um, my daughter is an accomplished pianist, and um, she's profoundly deaf, goes to cochlear implants, she's competed internationally. So I feel that nothing can stop them, and I think that I was fortunate to have parents who believe that nothing can stop me, that I can do whatever I want. So I think that's very important as a child to have that message be sent to you. So 
Well, it's starting to run out of time, and um, I think that, oh, no, I have more questions. Oh, you have one more. This is for uh, Christiana, about the intersection of disability and justice and equity and inclusion of or of people with mental concerns or living with disease. For example, what about folks with bipolar disorder or living with other chronic conditions like Crohn's or recently diagnosed, uh, recently di uh, cancer diagnosis? How do these wor worlds fit in your vision of disability and arts justice? Well, the vision, I would hope that the arts vision would also include these folks in your arts vision as well. Um, I think that one of the biggest things, not just as a consultant, but as a disability justice advocate, is that there's a whole world of disability that is happening um, at all times. And whether it's something that you are like us and you sit on panels and you talk about it, or it's something that you only deal with when it's time to take your medicine or it's time to see your doctor, or you get home and you start to take care of yourself after a long day, I think that's important. What I think to that question, what I can answer, and whoever it is, I would love to get coffee with you because I could talk your ear off about it, obviously. Um, but I think what's important about it is not only to include it, but to find, um, I think, you know, and we might differ, people might differ, but I do agree with part of cultural humility and, and working towards self-evaluation is, is proximity. And so doing it in a tactful way of finding ways to be in community with folks um, who have these, um, who, who live with these different sort of experiences so that you're not just getting one person um, to talk about it because there is a, 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 a whole other world that is uh, hardly ever talked about. And then I'll, and I know you're cutting me off, but I'll just say this one last thing. When I'm at, um, when I was at Seattle, you know, I'm not going to say this, I think it's important. So when I was at Seattle University, uh, Seattle, Seattle Opera, they asked me to be the social impact consultant. One of the first questions they asked me because Aida was coming up was, Christiana, what does Aida mean to the black community? And I said, well, well I can tell you what I think I use as a black community, and I can tell you what I what the what on the internet says. But you have to ask the black community to figure out what I eat means to the black community, which is when we started having our black inclusion forum. That's the same thing to this question. I could tell you what it feels like for me. Um, I think that it should all be included. But if you don't know, um, it, it, you know as a colloquial, so you don't know, you to ask somebody. Uh, and, and that might mean uh, affinity groups or focus groups or just your own self-education and awareness around that. Thank you so much. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left, and um, I just want to make sure that um, I give you enough time to have some food. We have some food out there. You might eat it all before you leave. And have <laughs> a chance to um, network with some people, find somebody you don't know very well, find out what they're doing um, around accessibility in the organization, soon contact information. Um, I want to give you a few resources that would be helpful. Um, the Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability Conference is this summer. 